I follow Jesus. I read my Bible regularly. I try to be nice to people. I let other drivers go ahead of me. I recycle. I tithe. Yet I often feel like life is a struggle. Uh, doesn't God, I don't know, owe me a, a little? I mean, at least a little? Look, I know Jesus died for my sins and I can never pay that back and I'm so grateful for that. I get all of that. But shouldn't I get to avoid some of the troubles other people deal with because I'm a card-carrying follower of Christ? I know Jesus said in this world you will have troubles. But shouldn't that just be some of the time? I mean, in our church alone, we have three people battling cancer. We have two people who are praying for heart or for uh, kidney transplants. We have a number of people who have lost loved ones recently. We have some that have had car accidents. Some that are looking down the barrel of divorce. I had a couple unanticipated trips to the emergency room this year. I mean, come on. Aren't Christ followers supposed to have it a little better? Jesus addresses this in one of his parables. Turn to Matthew 13, verse 24. It's called the parable of the weeds. It's one of most, Jesus' most intriguing parables. Now when I read this, you always look for the main point, where the point of surprise is. So be looking for it. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow up together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barns. Then he left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain the parable of the weeds to us. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. Jesus gives us a massive advantage in understanding this parable by telling us what it means. He doesn't do that with most of his parables. So we don't have to wonder, what's the good seed stand for? What, what are the weeds? What do they represent? Who sowed the weeds? Lord Jesus, be our teacher today. As we look at your teaching from years ago, what did you mean? What does it mean for us today? Our hearts are wide open. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's see what the parable means. Some good seed was planted. The servants are surprised by the weeds growing up. The servants ask a perfectly normal question. Do you want us to pull up the weeds? I mean, why not? Let's be sympathetic with the servants. I mean, Jesus told a parable of the sower where it says the uh, thorns choke out the seed. So naturally, we want to get rid of the blackberry bushes. We want to push them back. We want to pull the weeds. I mean, if you have a vegetable or a, a, a flower garden, what do you do? You pull weeds, right? The surprise is that the owner, who represents Jesus, says, no, don't pull the weeds. Let them grow up with the wheat. Wait until the harvest, the end of time. Then we'll separate the weeds from the wheat. What's Jesus trying to say in this parable? 
Remember, the, the point is always at the point of surprise. He says, God does not want his followers to separate themselves from the world. Now, Jesus tells us in the interpretation, good seed stands for sons of the kingdom. Christ's followers are planted in the world. Then weeds appear unexpectedly. He says, Satan sowed those. Satan comes. Uh, the weeds aren't noticed for a while. Matthew uses the word zizania uh, for weeds. It means darnel. It's a poisonous weed. It's botanically similar to bearded wheat. So you really can't tell the difference in the early stages of growth at least. The nar darnel shoots up in quantities, uh, great quantities, far more than we expect. The servant said, didn't you sow good seed? Where then did the weeds come from? They're surprised. What's the surprise of the parable? That Jesus says to leave the weeds. At first glance, we don't like the teaching in this parable. We don't like to hear about weeds. We don't like that we have to live with weeds. We're highly aware that we're living with weeds. Terrorists want to kill us. 50 people were killed in Orlando last night. They want to blow up our cities. That's why we stand in long lines for screening at airports around the world. Our military has fought in wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Our son signed up for the army and he came home and he said, Dad, it is so dangerous there. We're driving along and we're just looking for IEDs everywhere. It's so stressful. I mean, it's so dangerous today. You can't even let your kid walk home from school one block. Parable tells us that there is a Satan and he's deceptive. He works in secret against Christ. Be alert, Peter says, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. None of us wants to live with weeds. We don't want our children in unsafe situations with weeds that can choke them out. Jesus' response of leaving weeds is a surprise. It goes against all agricultural and spiritual rules. Over the last several decades, there's been uh, gains made in uh, the way we produce rice, and it's led to huge uh, increases in rice production. Two main changes uh, took place. One was the use of chemical fertilizers. And now many farmers are using organic chemical fertilizers. And the second thing they did, they began to plant it in rows. Why did they put it in rows? So you could weed it. Agriculturally, we know you have to remove weeds. As it leads to a psychological uh, observation, we resent the parable. We want ideal situations in which we can live, in which our children can be safe. Jamie just graduated from Lincoln High School. And next year, Erica will be going to Wilson High School. I mean, there are things that go on at those schools that, you know, aren't good. We all naturally want our kids to be in places that are safe. Jory and I have a, a second home in a Christian community in Michigan. We like it there because our girls can walk late at night and we don't worry. We wouldn't let them walk late at night in Portland. We can leave our doors unlocked there. You just, you just don't worry back there. But even in that environment, Jory and I have no illusions that this community is not going to have problems. I mean, the minute I walked on the premises, they had problems. It stopped being a perfect community. There are weeds there too. There are weeds in our homes. There are weeds in our churches. Jesus says it's impossible to be separated from all evil. And quite possibly, it's not in God's best interest. Why would the owner, why would Jesus say to leave the weeds? Why doesn't God want us to separate ourselves from the world? 
I can think of possibly four reasons. One, God wants us to learn patience with people. The first clear message in this parable is that Jesus wants us to be patient. The, the uh, servants come and say, shall we pull up the weeds? They want to get out there fast. He says, slow down, slow down. You won't be able to tell the difference between the weeds and the wheat. You might pull up the wheat. Be patient. You can't tell what God's going to do with a person. Be patient with life. There's evil in the world. Every day is not going to be great. You know it from this parable. Bad things happen. But your life isn't over. Keep enjoying it. God you know, made this beautiful world for us to enjoy. He wants us to enjoy life. That's a huge theme in the Bible. And one of the greatest things that can get you through life, help you make it in the real world, is to keep a good sense of humor. Laugh out loud. Let it out. Find something funny, even in the midst of your troubles. Two older women died, and they were met at the gates of heaven by St. Peter. St. Peter says, everything's going to go great for you here if you observe one important rule. Don't step on the ducks. Well, a couple days in, uh, one of the ladies stepped on a duck. And St. Peter said, if, if you do that, something bad's going to happen to you. And sure enough, Peter came the next day, and he chained her to this guy who was very unattractive. His missing teeth... He had a big scar on his face. His hair was all matted down. It looked like it had been washed for like two months. He had a big pot belly. And, well, the other lady wasn't going to let that happen to her. So she was very careful where she walked. But then a few days later, Peter came up to her and chained her to this very handsome guy. Dark hair, blue eyes, chiseled chest and biceps, kind of like mine. And she's all excited. She said, you know, I don't know what I did to deserve this. This is, this is great. And the guy says, I don't know what you did to deserve this, but I stepped on a duck. <laughs> Two, why doesn't God want us to separate ourselves from the world? God wants to leave us to leave judgment to him. You can't pull up the weeds. You can't tell the difference between the darnel and the weed and the wheat. You might judge one, judge a person and think he's a weed and be all wrong. Jesus says, you're not capable of separating the weeds from the wheat. George Barna says the number one thing non-believers dislike about Christians is that they feel like we're judgmental. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged. It's not our job to decide who's the weed and who's the wheat. We're to love all people. We're not to judge people. Everybody makes mistakes. That doesn't make them a bad person. Through our mistakes, we learn. Michael Jordan wrote, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. God doesn't want us to make premature judgments about people. We can't tell the difference between weeds and wheat. We can't tell what God's going to do with someone. Leave judgment to God. Everyone will stand before God at the end of time. Jesus tells us in the parable, there will be a day of judgment and he will separate the weeds from the wheat. Three, why doesn't God want us to separate ourselves from the world? Because God wants us to be the salt of the earth. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt does no good when it's separate. It's supposed to be rubbed into the meat. Salt in a salt shaker serves no function. Salt is a preservative. God wants Christ followers to act as a preservative in this world. It seems like the world is becoming increasingly evil, doesn't it? 
God wants us to keep it from becoming even worse. It's our purpose in life to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus suggests we actually will do better in a world with weeds because weeds provide us with a challenge and a purpose. The seed in this parable represents the sons of the kingdom, Christ followers. Jesus says, I plant you in the real world with no special protection. Your request for special protection and special growing conditions is denied. I want you to make it in the real world. I will not remove you from the real world because you are my strategy for preserving the world. Johnny Moore, in his book, Defying ISIS, that he wrote last year, he says one of the worst forces in the world today is ISIS. One of the worst forces for evil. And he says we can't just sit back and watch. Edmund Burke said for evil to triumph, it's only necessary for good people to do nothing. Johnny Moore suggests that we have to do with ISIS like we did with Ebola. September 26, 2014, a Liberian national walked into Dallas Hospital with Ebola. A week later, he was dead. Two of the workers that cared for him contracted the same disease. Ultimately, they were cleared and thousands of medical workers and Scientists, researchers descended on that part of Africa and medical workers, scientists, researchers, politicians all agreed for us to defeat Ebola, we had to take the fight outside our borders. And Johnny Moore suggests the same thing has to be done with ISIS. ISIS has swept through Syria and Iraq and when they find Christians, they'll ask the children, are you Christians? And if they say yes, they shoot them. Sometimes they say, they say if you convert to Islam, we'll let you live. But to Johnny Moore's knowledge, there's never been one Christian who has taken that offer to convert. Christian women are put in like trophy houses for the, for the uh, ISIS soldiers to to use for their pleasure when they're on break. They have systematically gone through and destroyed Christian churches, Christian libraries, Christian uh, holy sites. And this is where Christianity began. I don't think most of us recognize Christianity started in Jerusalem and it grew, you know, it went east first. Syria and Iraq and Assyria and then it went south through Saudi Arabia and India, Tibet. It went kind of south, west, over to Africa. And then it went north through Greece and up through Europe. But it primarily in the early centuries, it was a Middle Eastern. That's the center of it. And they have systematically gone through that and driven out Christians or killed them. And all the Christian, uh, you know, stuff that's there with hardly a word from the press. The least we can do is speak up. If you've given your life to Christ, you are his strategy, his salt to preserve the world. Four, why doesn't God want us to separate ourselves from the world? God wants us to be the light of the world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The final question we have to ask of this parable, is the wheat any match for the weeds? Is there any chance for the wheat making it? And Jesus answers with a resounding yes. Though the wheat must bear fruit in a less than ideal situation, there will be a great harvest in the end. The evil will face judgment and the righteous will shine. Jesus says as the weeds are pulled up 
and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus says a day of judgment is coming. All wrongs will be righted. Evil will be brought to an end. Those who cling to Jesus for forgiveness will shine. Maybe you're discouraged today. Maybe the weeds in your life have overwhelmed you. Jesus says, don't let go of your hope. All faith, all good deeds will be rewarded in the end. The Apostle Paul, one of his greatest lines, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Sometimes you say, well, why, why bother doing good? It's just, it's, we're so overwhelmed by evil. Jesus says, don't think that way. Nothing you do for Christ is in vain. You can live with an attitude of hope or despair. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important to me than the past. Attitude is more important than education. Attitude is more important than money. It's more important than circumstances. It's more important than appearances or giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company. It will cause a church to soar or sink. It will be the difference between a happy home and a home of horror. The remarkable thing is you have a choice every day what your attitude will be. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the tick of the clock. We cannot change the march toward death. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. The only thing we can do is play the hand we're dealt. That's our attitude. In the parable of the weeds and the wheat, Jesus says, I'm not going to remove the weeds. You will face evil. You will face trouble. There will be heartaches. You'll face death. There will be challenges in your world. But never lose hope. Keep a positive attitude because the wheat will win out over the weeds. So how do we reach people in the midst of the weeds? Let me just share a reminder for you who were here last week, for you who are not. Six things we can do to reach people in the midst of the weeds. One, identify people. You identify who is there in your life where you may be the only Christ-following churchgoer they know. Those are the people that God may want you to be the light of the world to. Two, pray. You pray for them. Always pray for them before you speak to them. Prayer is so key to this. It's depending on the Holy Spirit. You say, I'm open to you, Holy Spirit. Who do you want me to talk to today? Who do you want me to love? Who do you want me to build a relationship with? I'm available. Three, develop relationships with them. Studies show that the longer you go to church, the less non-Christian friends you have. So we have to intentionally make relationships with people who do not know Christ. Four, discover their story. It's important at some point in the conversation, tell me your story about God and faith. What's your story there? You want to hear their story before you tell your story. Then five, share your story. Share what Jesus has done for you. Make it personal. What difference has Jesus made in here? Don't just quote them verses, how they can become a Christian. And then five, invite. Invite them to give their life to Christ. Invite them to come to church with you or something at the church. Lord Jesus, thank you for this parable. It's a salty one. We don't really like what we're told in this parable. We have to live with weeds and it's going to be a challenge. But you tell us that's the way it is. You will not remove us from the world. We are your strategy in this world. So help us to depend on you and make a difference in this world. Be a preservative. Be a light. 
All right, I want to give you a moment to pray. You can respond to God. Are you willing to take the challenge to be salt and light and say, God, I want to, I want to fulfill that role. I'm going to quit complaining about the troubles in my life and the evil. That's part of the deal. It's not going to change. But I want to be a difference maker. If you've never given your life to Christ, you invite Jesus into your life right now. Say, so come in and be my Lord. I'll give you a minute to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing all of our prayers. Thank you for speaking to us today through your parable. In Jesus' name we pray.